Hi, everyone. Sorry for the, uh, for the technical hiccups, I guess. But first off, a round of applause for DEF CAMP, right? Super nice conference. And yeah, thank you all for, for coming here to listening to this talk. It will more or less be a little bit of a rant about things that I see when I work. And what do I do? I am a plumber. No, I'm not a plumber. I work as a security consultant for Assured and Cure53. It's a complicated love story. I own a consultancy called Assured, but I spend all my time pen testing with the penetration team Cure53. Um, so what do I do? I do a little bit of everything, but my main focus areas is around infrastructure. So I started out very early with VPN stuff. I would say that I know the open VPN code base pretty well. I do a lot of uh, yeah, penetration testing on VPN services, as well as scriptable infrastructure. But we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, yeah, my clients range from Linux Foundation all the way to Mozilla, where I do a lot of uh, IoT penetration testing. So I've been hacking toys for a couple of weeks. Pretty nice. They will be out soon. Uh, we did one really neat toy called Cloud Pets. Anyone heard about Cloud Pets? There's a little nice unicorn where you can press the paws. Don't buy that one, it's terrible. Read the report. So, let's discuss the outline of the talk today. So we're going to talk a little bit about containers, what containers are and what they're not. We're going to talk about orchestrations. And we're going to have a brief look at the pipelines connecting all of this fun stuff. And then we're going to take a deep venture into what security issues we might have when setting up our orchestrations. And then we're going to have a look at some fails. Um, that's what we're going to do. So to start this off, I would like to explain just the terminology, just a brief look into containers, orchestration, pipelines, what I think they are in my opinion, and how to use them and how to maybe abuse them, I guess. So. This image, I think a lot of people have seen before. It's like a standard way of comparing what a virtual machine is in regards to a container, right? So the main difference here is that a container is just an isolated piece of the, the host operating system. It has its own binaries. It has its own libraries. It runs its own processors. It has its own file system. Uh, its own isolated network and network interfaces have, can have multiple uh, but it all runs and gets orchestrated by a container engine. A lot of people would like said uh, they would put an equal sign in the container agent to Docker, but there is a multiple different uh, container systems out there. We're going to talk about them, a few of them. So the beneficial thing with containers is that we can run them without any hassle, right? We don't have to install the guest operating system. We don't have to choose the flavor of the guest operating system because we can just manually spin up a binary inside of an isolated host that is cross-platform. So it's a really neat way to create platform independence and have it scalable. So it's not a new thing, right? It sort of comes from the, the late eight, the, the, in the beginning of the 80s, I would say, 79, with fruit and fruit yells. And it's sort of all built up on that. Uh, that topology. So in the early days, we had Shrewd Yale escapes. Anyone knows if we have the same problem today? Might have, right? And then we sort of, yeah, these guys came along. And they sort of helped us with, they, they make sure that I will never be out of work. That's one thing for sure. So this is, uh, this is like the DevOps uh, infinite knot, right? So continuous everything. That's the, that's the thing we should do, right? Um, well, I don't disagree. I think there are some good stuff here, like really good stuff. Uh, but there is one thing that it's sort of, it's so many of them, all the configurations that you can do to them, all the customization, and then on top of it, your custom code, your custom product, right? The complexity just increases immensely. Um, in my focus area, I sort of in the middle layer, right? So I do uh, infrastructure as code. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go 
a step further. So this is my awesome picture to explain how the orchestration or the pipeline works. So at the left side, we have the developers, as you can see, checker shirt and stuff. They're feeding the, uh, the pipeline with uh, Turkey, or in, in this case, code. And it gets placed in a repository. Could be either one of the repositories. I just pick Bitbucket, GitLab, and GitHub because they're big. And that kind of repository holds our source code and whatnot. Should not like you should not put your secrets there. How many guys or women have put their AVS secrets in the GitHub repo? A mistake. I've done it. You can confess. I know you've done it. Gitminder is the awesome tool, right? You can just find out who did what and did not. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, and then you can push your infrastructure to your GitHub as well, because that's convenient, because your scriptable infrastructure is nice. Physical routers and like real hardware is so outdated, you, everything should be code. And I agree, it's a good thing, but a developer and a network engineer, they're like two different roles, so you need to have pretty good knowledge in what you're doing when you're implementing an network infrastructure by code. And then we send everything out as instructions to our continuous delivery platforms. In this case, Travis, Jenkins, and CircleCI. How many in here has run with Jenkins? A few, like a lot of people, right? So how many of you have got your Jenkins instances published online so you can reach them? Nobody? You're liars, man. I know you're liars. Yeah, they, it's, it's a terrible idea because it holds all your secrets, it holds all your build platform, it holds all your source code. You can get shell outputs, you can do whatever. Um, but it's a good tool. It, it's automating and it helps us to deliver on time and it's, it's a neat feature when it works, right? But there is implications with it. And when it comes to container, I just picked three. I took Docker, uh, the Linux one, and Rocket because they are widely used. And they are the runtime that we, we run our applications in. But in my, in my opinion, they're computers. They can do whatever. Like any base image now contains curl, vget, or whatever, right? And we can, we can compile stuff inside of them. So if we get access to a pod, yeah, we more or less have, have access to everything. I'm going to show you it later. And then we have the orchestration, because all the hip app today they really need to scale, and they need to scale autonomously, right? So we put in an orchestration engine that just scales up our service, just automate, automating the progress of spanning new containers for us so that we get Netflix, or we get like content, right? Um, Docker Swarm, show of hands, you know what it is? Yeah, a few, Kubernetes, more, that's awesome. How many people has configured and built their own Kubernetes cluster? Not that many. How many know how it wor actually works? <laughs> right? It's more or less black magic. I agree with you 100%, right? So the thing that I find is like when you go to Kubernetes site, it's like, OK, I have no idea what it is. It's cool. It's hip. Everybody's using it. Really not sure what I should use it, but let's, we're early adopters. Let's do this, right? So we install Kubernetes, and we're looking for a guide. There is no. There is no guide. This is how you install Kubernetes. It does not exist. That's sort of a warning sign for me. So, um, and then, of course, we need to monitor everything. So we have the log stash. We have Kibana. We have, yeah, whatever to just Grafana in this case. But then again, that's just the developing tools. Then we have our IDEs, and we have the developers themselves. But I'm not going to talk about them. But we have a supporting middle layer. We have MPS. We have Node.js. We have uh, Docker Hub. We have a lot of dependencies and support systems. We have Redis. How many in here use Redis? Yeah, a few of you. How many of you use Redis 5.0? Like one guy, two guys. Yeah. How many of you use their custom configuration in Redis? Yeah, two. That's good. Cool. So I'm going to focus on Redis and Kubernetes later on. But to just draft my picture here is like every piece of, every icon on the screen is more or less connected, right? So we're creating an environment that is super complex. It demands a lot of different skill sets. It demands you to know code. It demands you to know how to configure a SQL server. It demands how to know set up proper ACLs, ingress, egress control. So it's a complex environment. 
And yeah, I almost forgot about it, the secret store. We have to manage our secret somehow. Because plain text passwords, API keys, our S3 bucket keys, our access policies, everything like that in the, right, in the wrong person's hand could be devastating, right? So how many in here has implemented KMS in the AVS instances? Yeah, a few. How about the, the HashiCorp's vault? Good, good. That's a good product. I like it. Yeah, well, let's continue. Let's continue. So this is the, most, this is the ba baseline. Like, we don't want sad whales in our infrastructure, and we don't want to be the guy who's in the pole fixing the wires, not knowing what the hell he's doing, right? And yeah, my favorite sitcom. Everything is connected. So one small misconfiguration in any of these products could lead to an attack chain that compromised your entire infrastructure. And we're going to look at that in a little bit. So security challenges in DevOps or in like modern day supply lines and pipelines? Yep, there is a few, right? And the attack surface nowadays is even bigger than it was before. There are like thousands of doors to, to enter. I'm so tired of pen tests. I do a lot of pen tests, right, for, for open source products. I think I, this year, tested like six or eight different REST API services that just spun up. I have no idea why, why, why. like message small microservices that, yeah, has to be a REST interface and do stuff. I don't know what you should, yeah, have them, why you use them. But to come back to this, um, this picture, so the, the, the outline is more or less like we only need one of, uh, one attack vector more or less to compromise the entire infrastructure. And I'm not sure that's good, right? So in the before times, we have an inside, we had an outside, and we had the demilitarized zone. We sort of segmented our networks. We have the capability now to do that at, at a much, much better scale, but somehow we don't. And somehow, like, the, the things that I see when it comes to infrastructure is that we tend to like, oh, it's, it's so complicated with firewall rules, and this is going to do this, and this is going to drop that. So it's like, I can't bother. Let's just put it into a socket, and everything is awesome. That's more or less it. And then just like basic understanding of network infrastructure and how network works, it's sort of forgotten. It's just can't have that. And I don't blame people, because the reality is that we have bare metal hardware. We have networks. Uh, physical networks, in virtual networks, in virtual networks, in virtual networks, in virtual networks, and then it's gone, right? So there's so much complexity involved in our modern day supply line, so it's hard to keep up. Yeah, I sort of jumped a bit. This is more or less what we, like basic stuff that we should think about. It's amazing how many misconfigurations there is out there. Like, it's OVASP. Uh, OVAS top six, I think, is mis security misconfiguration in products. I think that's the, the thing, and it's only in the OVAS top 10, right? But it, it's so common that we run into like generically configured stuff, and it's not like, oh, you use default credentials. That happens too, of course, but there is more or less, okay, we spin this service from this configuration file, and we have no idea if 0000 means that we sort of attach it to localhost, or is it the interface, or is it every IP address on the machine, or I have no idea, it's, it works, leave it alone, right? So it sort of creates a lot of problems for us. That's not good. Um, yeah. And then we have the fails, right? It's time. Destruction, chaos, and suffering awaits the one who waits. So today we're going to talk about some really, yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't say nice, but really simple fails in Kubernetes and Redis. Um, we're going to start with Kubernetes. It's nothing new. Um, Kubernetes, for the ones that haven't touched it, it's an orchestration engine. It can do anything. And everyone in the audience is like, oh, what an awesome product. It can do anything. It literally can do anything. It's the behemoth of a source code. Uh, it could spin up containers. It could spin up microservices. It could be your router. It could be your container engine. It could be whatever you can put down in a YAML file and parse, of course. Then it would run. So this is the basic outline of the Kubernetes instance, right? Uh, it consists of a Kubernetes master core 
uh, that has a f multiple APIs connected to it, because everything needs to be communicated through an API, because that's how you do stuff. Uh, it has a scheduler, it has a controller, and it has an ETCD instance. The ETCD instance is more like a single point of truth. It will store credential data. It could store information about the cluster, such as the uh, certificates used for client-side authentication and server-side authentication. It will contain all the namespaces in the cluster. It will hold keys and key value stores. It will host parameters and whatnot. On top of this master node, we have the slaves, the nodes, the actual minions of the workforce of Kubernetes. So the blue side, it's like the kings and queens and the, yeah, the cool guys, and the green one is the guys that do all the work. So a slave node sort of consists of pods and pods, just to make things a little bit simpler. A pod is actually a container, but it's not a container because it's a pod, but it's basically a container. Yeah, and on top of that, we have a Docker engine, maybe, or, or a rocket engine, or we, have, we also have kubelets. Uh, they're small, defined code stuffs. We're gonna, not going to go into that in detail. And we have the kube proxy, and we have flannel. There was a few guys and girls in here who has configured Kubernetes. Do you run flannel? No? Oh, that's rare. Flannel is the, it's a, it's a router, more or less, to manage traffic. And it's sort of like everyone that runs Kubernetes runs Flannel because it's, yeah, because it's there. Um, and then, yeah, the pod can host a bunch of other services like network segments, uh, management interfaces, DNS, MX records, yeah, UIs and whatnot. I'm going to fix this a bit, yeah. So, um, yeah, this is the basic outline of it. And then you have an image repository where you can spin up and scale up your, your images. And the, the, the main thing with Kubernetes is that it is an auto-scaling cluster. So you can deploy it on nodes, define a lot of master nodes, and just push it out to the world, put your super cool uh, meme generator there, and then it will scale to infinity and beyond, and everything will work just fine. But as we mentioned before, there is no real guide on how to install it. There is like excerpts of stuff, how to define and configure stuff. And believe me, it's hard. So let's say we, we managed to install our master cluster node and everything runs good. Is there anything we need to think about when we actually get the templates that we steal from the Kubernetes sites and from other GitHub repos that we find? You can be honest, you don't configure your own. No, you steal. So yeah, there is a few, right? <clears throat> this is just a bare minimum that you have to consider and define and do something about. Otherwise, you basically, yeah, insert any, yeah, improper word, right? You're, 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 yeah, it will be owned one way or another. One can think like API authentication would be a good thing to implement by default. They actually have implemented the role-based authentication model from later versions, but a lot of uh, clusters that I see that are production ready don't run the latest version because there is a lot of beta and alpha features included there. So people are scared for using them. So on the internet today, I would say there is like a 50-50 split. Like some people really, really know what they do when they're deploying Kubernetes clusters and some really, really don't know how they do it. And it sort of ends up as a nice configuration mess. Um, there are multiple management APIs in Kubernetes. Some of them are read-only and you think, oh, well, well, what's wrong with that? Well, read-only means that you can pull out all the information like running pods, uh, traces, logs, and whatnot. So you can get a lot of information disclosure just asking the API, and it's not closable. Well, it is sort of closed now. We're going to discuss it later. But it's, yeah, it's a big, complex behemoth. You, you catch my drift. So let's go back to, the, to this ETCD instance that we see in the bottom here, right? This is from the uh, documentation on the Kubernetes site. So it says, allowing other components within the cluster to access the master ETDC instance with read or write access to the full key space is equivalent granting cluster admin access, right? So let's say, hypothet hypothetically, that someone put this on the internet. Would that be a good thing? No, maybe? Well, there is a few there. It's super nice though. Oh, 
Oh, we're getting in the JSON moment here. It was more like a distortion, not, not, no one shooting at me yet. So this is a couple of ETDC instances out there in the world. Um, I went through them. I picked one. I masked it with smileys because I like smileys. So this, uh, this company, they're hosting their infrastructure in, in uh, Amazon. I thought I would give you that. This company's sole product, does anyone have seen the KCF.tar? Find me later. Um, this company actually sells Kubernetes clusters to its uh, client, so you can, you can purchase, a, you purchase something and you will be able to submit your own pods and yeah, they will manage your cluster for you. So I was so intrigued because a company that actually sells Kubernetes as a service, um, they, yeah, they post their entire ETD since on the internet, so we had to sort of sort it out. So the most epic function ever is, uh, yeah, question mark, recursive equals true. Anyone knows what it does? It's more, or, it's more or less like a directory traversal thing. So we know that there is a path called v2 and keys, right? So we throw in recursive leakers true, and it will give us the entire subset from that trailing slash all the way down. So it will give us all the keys that are, and all the namespaces that are configured there. Super convenient. And I dig, dig around, and I found this kcf.tar. This is actually it. Uh, can anyone say what it is? Oh, I'm not going to taunt you. It's a base64 blob with a lot of new lines in it. And if you strip the new lines and make it a, uh, a tar file, it actually uh, decompresses to this. This is, this is like gold. So this is the golden ticket. You don't even have to buy their service. You can use this. And you can sign up your own pods, your own clusters, whatever. It's just free. But I was, yeah, I actually asked some of the speakers before, should I mask the private keys? I think you should, yeah. So the, the private keys are masked, and these are used for auth authorization and authentication to the cluster masters and to all the pods. So we can get rudimentary read access and write access to the pods, and all the pods will contain service tokens, and all the service tokens are able to, to, uh, to talk to the cluster administrative interfaces, right? So we're moving along. Let's say that we now have write, uh, read access or write access to a cluster but we don't have cluster admin access, all the pods on the system will get a service token from the Kubernetes master so it could take instructions, right? This is not a new thing. This has been around for ages, this attack. So what you do, curl is a part of the base image in the pod, right? So you curl down the cluster administration binaries, run them with the service token that natively is there on the pod, and then you can use cube control to, yeah, query for secrets in all namespaces and return it in a YAML file, please. And then you get all the secrets configured for the cluster. And it could be anything. It could be SQL passwords. It could be AVS secrets. It could be whatever, right? Pretty nice. Pretty nice. Since, yeah, there is, like, almost everywhere I look, there is a one user thing on the pods and the containers. So we don't have like multiple user and drop rules and drop to and so forth. So it's like, yeah, if you own the pod, you own the world. But there is more. This little sucker actually works. So what we're doing here is that we are, we are going through a management UI that has uh, read and write access. And we are deploying, we're, use, we're using it for code execution. So in this case, we are listing all the file systems. Uh, all the files in the in the root where we are, and the other one we list all the uh, environmental variables that are set. So we get like hopefully passwords and keys and whatnot. Uh, this is a fun thing actually. Um, it's I think the common name on the internet is cube cube exploit. I think, yeah, cube exploit. Uh, Tesla had the same thing. So the Tesla they run Kubernetes. They they had a high bill, you could say. Someone managed to inject uh, pods in the Tesla's Kubernetes cluster, but they didn't take over anything because, you know, Tesla has a wallet, a big wallet, right? Because, and they have auto scaling Kubernetes clusters. So we install a pod that mines Monero for us. That's some next level evil, uh, evil villain shit, right? So that's funny. 
But the thing is that I would like to address with this uh, print screen from GitHub is actually that pod to pod command execution has been an open issue for the project for over a year. They actually found out, they actually, this is not really true. It's open to this day, so you can go out and check it out. But they actually have implemented uh, webhooks so that you can more or less ACL control anonymous access to the endpoints. And uh, they have like a, a TLS uh, authorization uh, thing in it as well. So you can you could sort of limit it out, but yeah, nobody does. It saddens me. So that's a quick, super quick introduction to Kubernetes uh, misconfigurations. And the ne next little guy, it's a support system, right? Uh, Mon mon one of like millions, I would say. So Redis, for you who don't know, it's like a, it's a cache, a web cache. It's commonly deployed. It uses to cache queries so you can respond super quick and have a generic, yeah, you can, it helps you in some way. I don't know, I'm not a developer, but it's out there, right? But the funny thing with Redis is that the threat model is awesome. So, Redis is designed to be accessed by trusted clients inside a trusted environment. This means that it usually is not a good idea to expose the Redis instance directly to the internet or in, uh, in general to any environment where an untrusted client can connect to it, right? Now it's fun. 24,577 hosts, and they are all vulnerable for the attack I'm gonna show you now. There are multiple more that are published directly to the internet. I guess they didn't read this at all. So it's like, I ah, done, nah, let's go. So they're published, right? So what can you do from here? It sort of depends. In, my, in this example, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do something cool. We're gonna use the Ready CLI, that it is a, is a native client for integrating with or in, interfacing with your Redis server. And we're gonna, yeah, add our SSO keys to, to authorize keys on the file system. This is something that has been around since 2015. And one of the developers of Redis actually posted a blog post like, this is what you can do. And he sort of altered it in some weird ways. But it's like, if you read it line by line, you will understand what you can throw out and what you can use. They invented something called uh, protected mode Protected mode, I think that's the word for it. And it comes natively now in the configuration file when you download Redis. But the funny thing is, when you go to uh, AVS, they have an AMI for, for Redis. Has anyone deployed Redis in, in AVS? No? Yeah, a few of you. So the configuration file that it comes with actually has the unprotected, uh, unprotected no. So it's actually off by default which leads this service vulnerable as heck, because it's unauthenticated. You could just connect to it and do whatever, right? And you will have the rights on the operating system as the user running the service, so it's pretty bad. And then there is some sm smart ass people in the crowd, I can see it, thinking what I'm thinking. You can enable authentication on Redis. You can. And what would you say would be an easy, enough a long password? Would it be 20 characters, Jason? Eight characters, All right. let's, say, let's say 20 characters, okay? And then we go back to, to the, the, the fact that Redis is actually a database that is designed to do a lot of parallel queries and a lot of input-output. So would it be hard to establish millions of threads to brute force and authentication? Maybe not, right? So it's, it's pretty easily brute forced as well. But yeah, this is my machine. It's called Hastur. It's actually what the one over there, because I like the Shutulu saga. You have to read it. So all my computers are Hastur and Shutulu and whatnot. But this is Hastur. It runs the latest Redis version. It doesn't run in protected mode. And we're going to do some magic. First off, we need to build ourselves a public key. And this is, this is like the trickiest part of the attack. So what are we doing here, line by line? We're adding two new lines in the beginning of my public key and two new lines in the end of my public key. And then we get more or less the result uh, down below. Why is it that way? If you're interested, come find me later, right? 
So we take this, we name it key.txt. We fire up, we just use cat and we pipe it uh, to the Redis CLI. And we use the, uh, the dash x, which is an awesome function that puts the input into memory. And we, yeah, we add a name whoop, because whoop is cool. Uh, so we put it there. And so now it, now we send my public key to the memory of the Redis instances, or the instance. And it takes any string uh, whatsoever you put in there. You can, you can let your imagination wander and yeah, do the math. Then we go, well, then we connect to the Redis instances, no authentication whatsoever. We set the directory. Uh, in this case, it's user, yeslar, that's my username, dot SSH, we get OK. Whoop, whoop, Redis can, can list the contents on my dot SSH folder. Cool. So we, it says OK, but we really would like to see. So we config get directory, and we see that key value 2 has user yeslar dot SSH. And then we just, yeah, set the new file name. Oh, sorry, I'm getting warm up here, the lights. Then we set the DB file name, so two authorized keys, and then we press OK and save. So then we will save the, uh, yeah, the string that we set in memory to authorized keys. And then we press save and OK. And guess what? DB is saved on disk, and I use the public auth, and I get the shell on Huster as the user Jesslar, because user Jesslar is running the Redis instances. And now the critics in the audience will say, I will never run SSH on my machine uh, on my Redis instance. Now, of course you could. You, uh, maybe you're super good at that. Then we could write to crontab, crondaily. We could do whatever. We can inject whatever we would like, right? So pretty much a bad thing. Let's see how I'm doing in time. Pretty good, cool. Yeah, so takeaways. Um, ensure that you actually enable uh, your security features correctly and that you understand them. Um, limit access to your, to your like management interfaces. And I mean like proper ACL controls, no, no black magic. If you don't understand how it works, then it's probably not the right way. So role-based role authentication, super important. If you don't take your time, like categorizing all your users, it will end up in a big fat mess, in my opinion. You should do the work uh, beforehand. In, in a modern day DevOps supply plan, I would say like, no one has the oversight, and that's the problem. So we need to, need to know what we're doing, we need to know what we're deploying. We will always write bad code, like always. My code is always shitty. It's like, it's vulnerable by the design, I made it. So we need to implement the defense in depth even there, right? So we need to be sure that we are committing good stuff. And when we configure our repos and infrastructure and whatnot, we need to be make sure that we know what we're doing. Use separate environment for dev and test and production. That never happens. But still, like everyone, yeah, we use QA, we do everything. But we sort of always ship to production and we do commits to production because it's cool. Um, yeah, proper access controls. We need to know how IP tables work. It's super easy, it's not hard. Uh, do security audits, and you don't have to buy it from a super expensive penetration testing firm or a bug bounty thing, but do it internally. Make it a game out of it. Play around with it. Order each other's code. It will be fun. Like, you suck. Yeah, you do. Oh, yeah, it's fun. But th it's a good thing, I would say. So we need to help each other. That's, that's the take -outs. And that's about it for me. I have one thing that I would like to say. I'm going to steal the stage because I'm actually here. Uh, shameless plug time. If you want to go to Sweden, you have to check out Security Fest. Uh, it's a security conference, single track one for two days in Gothenburg, Sweden. Um, the CFP is open, so if you would like to speak, send in your request and we will answer you. So if you don't have anything else to do on the 23rd and 24th of uh, May in 2019, you should come to Gothenburg. It will be awesome. And that's it. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Jasper. We managed not only to stand up, but exactly. Go for Jason. Of course. So how many private keys have you found on the internet like A lot, that? <laughs> a lot. There is a lot, but this is like only one service. There are multiple of them. So, we, But I think the, the main thing is, the main takeoff like this is like, you have to know 
uh, how to bind a service to a specific interface. And it will be make sense to have it in the private realm of the computer, like localhost or something that is not internet routable, I would say. But it's a, it's a, there's a lot of stuff out there. And the most important question, are you willing to share those keys? Yeah, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, behind closed doors, I would do it. Other questions for Jesper? We have time. There's a head over there. Coming to you now. Cool. Hello. Hi. I was wondering what is the best approach on securing a container? Uh, isolation, I would say. Um, besides that? Besides isolation, uh, remove all the unnecessary binaries. Uh, make sure to implement proper drop to rules. So you, maybe you should have multiple users in your container. The main issue is that we all, most of us choose uh, the most popular container uh, for a certain platform and we go from that. Yeah, right. But most of them have several other pr uh, programs installed that we do not use and they may have secu security flaws in them. Yeah. Yeah. So is the best approach to start from scratch, from a fresh install and... I mean both yes and no. I would say that it will be a limited factor in the developing lifecycle, right? But if you develop in a contained environment, I don't see any point of doing the, the hardening work at the beginning. So mm -hmm. the just get shit to work phase is okay. And I sort of do that myself. But when it's time to shift to production, I think it's super important to do your homework to actually take time and look what binaries are we using, what is rubbish here, and then, sh then, then build your own. And it's important for verification issues as well. If you, if you depend on Docker Hub for all your images, let's say, a lot of people do, or launchpad.net. This is a true story I'm gonna share with you right now, because, yeah. I audited uh, a crypto bank, and they thought it was an awesome idea to download PHP framework from a Russian guy through Launch Hub without any verification. And when I, t and I brought it up, and they was like, yeah, what about this PHP? Yeah, but it's not the official release. Yeah, so I would say like, you have to be, you have to do your work, uh, you have to do security work continuously, uh, you need to be aware. So isolate your container by removing stuff that is unused, I would say it's a good, good way of going. And then maybe sign it to get a cryptographic hash or something so you know that what's running is running. And implement maybe autonomous security workers like, like auditing, yeah, regularly. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Yeah? Yep, coming to you. Well, thank you for giving us reasons to have more nightmares at night. Ah, sweet. As You're welcome. The You're blue welcome. team. I have more. So, <laughs> uh, I want to ask if you use any open source platform for scanning vulnerabilities in Kubernetes, like yeah, Cube I Hunter or yeah, I used. Do you have any recommendations? Can't for re uh, yeah, find me afterward. I'm going to send you some stuff. I have a bunch of like small snippets that I use. I'm like I'm the guy that I download all the tools, and I was like, don't need that, don't need that, and I take this, and I, this would be good, and yeah. So I have a bit of a repo for Kubernetes automation. You can you find me later. I will show you. Cool. Anyone awesome. Else? We still have questions. One over there. Yep. Yep. Hey, so I was wondering in your pen testing, did you run across a lot of containers that were custom Is, uh, in our applications? We build our own containers, yeah. many of them are in Go, and they just, uh, we create them from scratch, which means we just get the binary. Yeah, both yes and no. Like some companies that we audit, we are very, very good. So they actually know exactly what they're doing. We can't find any, if we get source code accessed, we, we hardly never find any syncs. The code is like super tight and neat. And then we see the complete opposite. So I couldn't say that it's like more favorable, like people running custom and defaults. I see there would be a slight favor for default ones because it's easy. That's my point of view. And then mixtures, like getting default images for certain things and then having customized stuff maybe? Yeah, yeah, it could be custom. Yeah, it could be both as well. It sort of depends on what the product is, I guess. Like I would say, I've, like there's a few instances that I've never seen Flannel installed, but Flannel is like always used, but it's not the part of Kubernetes like native, but okay. it's like a, that's a default that's always there. And custom code, it depends. It depends what the product is. So okay. yeah. Thank you. No worries. Any more Having questions? Awesome questions. We still have time for about two or three more. Don't be shy. Yep. I'm dangerous. 
here. Yep. Uh, what do you think about the infrastructure as a code? So Terraform. Stuff I like think that Terraform HashiCorp is doing a great job. Uh, I think uh, Vault is an excellent project for encrypting your secrets. Uh, I think it's a good thing. Terraforming is good, but Terraforming as as code, as, as infrastructure as code, is good, but it has its drawbacks as well. I mean, I've audited a system where the TF stage files is still remaining on the system, so you just cat them and then you get all the console outputs and you get all the keys. So you, it sort of always drills down to that you have to know what you're doing, more or less. But don't you think that infrastructure as a code forces you to know better what you're doing than using? One could actually think that, but I would say, I would argue it's the opposite, because there is internet and there is Google, and there is a lot of templates out there. And I'm lazy. I have to, un have to be honest, I'm lazy, and a bunch of people that I see, the, 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 the solutions I see are lazy people. So we copy. And it's okay, but we need to actually know the impl implications when we copy stuff. That's my, my yeah, answer. Anyone else? Who wants to ask one last question? Yeah, one over there. <laughs> I get the light in my eyes, but I don't really. Hello. Hello. Uh, did you try to find also vulnerabilities for uh, Jenkins? Yeah, there is a, a, I don't know if you, like two weeks ago, there was like this uh, uh, direct object uh, issue that if you knew the exact path of uh, the Euro path, you will get the content without any authentication. So that's, that's Jenkins has multiples of those, I would say. So yeah. But it's almost easier than that. Like n nobody really implements uh, matrix level security. Uh, so it's more or less like you find it in after a post exploitation because we almost always get a foothold somehow because the, yeah, we, we do. And then we find the Jenkins instance and we more or less always get access to it. Uh, I actually had some Jenkins slides in it bef uh, as well, but I couldn't, couldn't fit it in the talk. But then I also did a crawler that, that went through the internet just looking for open Jenkins instances, and there is a lot of them. Uh, one honeypot that I found that was actually allowing anonymous access, and it was looping cat memes when you, when you logged into it. It's super nice. But yeah, but Jenkins, it's, it's a nightmare. And then with Jenkins, you need to secure it. You need to use Jenkins credential sets. You should not use custom uh, Ansible files. You should, you should use the functions in Jenkins all the way. So adopt the entire ecosystem, because uh, like I can like in nine nine times out of ten when I log into a Jenkins instance and go to the console commit for for a build, you will see credentials or or sensitive stuff. Yeah. Do we have time for one more? Anyone? No? Everyone's out of question. No, there is one. Cool. Go. Please hold your hand up so we can see. Okay. <coughs> you wrote uh, on a slide that uh, we should never trust uh, networking due to this uh, thing. Uh, should we, uh, I don't know, worry about uh, communication uh, between uh, pods in the same uh, Kubernetes cluster? Or should we opt for, uh, I don't know, solution like uh, Istio? I think that uh, they provide some uh, uh, channels yep. uh, security or something so like that. So if I understand your correction, should intrazone or like pod-to-pod -pod communication be protected and encrypted? And I believe yes. Uh, when it comes to Kubernetes, I'm only aware of Spiffy. Uh, and Spiffy is more or less TLS everywhere. Uh, that's a good thing to implement. Like we need to think like uh, any other network, we would not put, the, well, okay. I showed you slides of stuff that is put on the internet, but any like, real security conscious uh, company should use the onion method, right? So you put everything in behind layers of layers of protection. That will be the, the, the main thing. And we have the same issues with Kubernetes clusters. We need to keep the management interfaces separate to the production interfaces. And we should, yeah. So I would say encryption is as the important in a pod-to-pod -pod infrastructure as well. Cool. Anyone else? Awesome. No? Uh, that's about it for our time. Cool. Thank you so much, Jasper. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.